In our last video, we built out the ability to register and log in users to our web app, to our REST API rather. And we're to the point now where we can extend this so it'll be possible to use it in our Angular app or other front ends or other uh, systems over, like doing it remote. So let's just look at what we have here. So right now, if I were to log in to my account, so I have previously registered uh, username Dave, password equals secret123. And if I were to log in, what it's gonna do is it's going to give me back a 200 response and it's gonna say, it worked, you're logged in. But what does it mean to be logged in? So one of the things about being logged in is I've gone through the trouble of authenticating myself. So I've said, I am who I, I, am who I say that I am. I've proven to you that I am the same Dave who registered previously because I have the same password that produced the hash that is stored in your database. But I don't have any way of staying logged in. So right now, you know, we log you in and we send you back a login successful. And then what? So in Web322, you, when you built out stuff like this, you would work with the session on the web server and you would put user information on the session to say, okay, this user Dave is currently logged in and you would have session information that would live for the length of the session. And so you could have a website where the user's connected, they go through your login flow, and then you record information on the request.session so you're using session objects to do it. So you can do this kind of thing with sessions and cookies and so on, and that works fine. But we want to use a different kind of architecture. I wanna be able to have a third party web app, like an Angular app, which is connecting over to this REST API, but they're not hosted on the same server. So we may have our Angular app hosted on Netlify or Vercel or GitHub Pages or something like that. And we might have this bridge API, the REST API running on Heroku or Amazon or whatever cloud. So they're running on two different systems. So having session information inside of the bridge API is useless um, because the user is off using another app. We need, we need a different we need a different way to do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to use we're going to use a technology called JSON Web Tokens, and what it's going to allow us to do is authenticate a user and say, you know, you've logged in, you are Dave, or you are who you are, and you have the right password, and then it's going to allow me to give the user back a token, and that token is going to be something that they can carry around with them. And every time they make a new request, they're gonna give me back the token and I'm gonna inspect the token and I'm gonna make sure that it's legitimate. And then if it is, I'm gonna allow them to do whatever it is they're asking to do. So to make this work, I'm gonna use JSON web tokens, which I'll explain in more detail in a second. I'm gonna combine it with this Passport technology. So Passport is a way to build authentication and authorization into systems like Express, it's really, it, it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you to figure out whether or not a user, uh, after they've logged in, it gives you middleware to say, is this user previously, have they previously been authenticated? So it's gonna handle a lot of the, um, the bits in the web server for figuring this out. And the thing that's great about Passport is, there are, it's built in a modular way with these different strategies and they have strategies for just about every kind of authentication system that you can think of. So you can use Passport to connect up to third party authentication services like Facebook and Google and Twitter and LinkedIn and all the rest of it. But you can also use JSON web tokens with your own server. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use Passport and the Passport JWT module to do this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through and talk about the code, but let me first start and just talk to you about what a JSON web token is. 
So if you go to jwt.io, you can have a look at this. And I'm going to scroll down here and just show you an example of uh, what a JSON web token looks like. So this is one right here on the left. And over here on the right, you can see um, how it's being parsed out. And I'll just explain what this is. So JSON web tokens, it's, a, it's an open standard, which means it works with every programming language and framework that you'll use. It's not specific to JavaScript, even though it's, you know, it has a JSON in it. It sounds like it's a JavaScript only thing, but you can use this with all different technologies. And what it lets you do is it gives you a very compact, like look at how small this is. This is a very small string and it gives you a very compact and secure way to share a JSON object over a network. So what happens with a JWT or a JSON web token is that they get signed and verified. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bunch of information into the payload of a, uh, let me just fix this. I'm going to put a bunch of information into the payload portion of a JWT. And then that information is going to get signed, meaning that it's, gonna, it's not going to be possible for anyone to tamper with the data that's inside here, because if they do, then the hashing algorithm that we've used is not going to match when we try and in inspect um, how, this thing, uh, how this thing was originally signed. So let's just look at the structure of this so you can understand what I'm talking about. We have three sections, and you can see here that they've been color-coded. So the first part is this header, this part right here. And what the header does is it identifies this as a token. And it says that, so this is a JWT type token. And it also tells you the algorithm that's being used to sign it. Okay, so you know they have all different algorithms that could be used, but the hashing algorithm that was used is listed here. The part here that's in purple is the payload. So what you're really trying to do when you create a, a JavaScript web token is you're trying to put what are called claims inside of the token. So a claim is something like a username. So a username, an email, something like that. And you're, you're basically making the claim that says, if I have this token, I am this person, or I am this user, or this I am this entity. So sub is the subject. This might be like a user ID and name might be their display name. Um, and you'll have other information in here too, like when the, when the token expires, etc. So the, the middle part here is the payload. And the payload is generally really small. You're not trying to put megabytes of data in here. You're trying to put just the smallest amount of information that you need in order to identify who this user is. So the user has already logged in, they've already got this token, and the token says this user that, um, that ha is holding this token is legitimate. The last thing that you have, this third part here, is the signature. And the signature is generated from the header and the payload plus one other part, and that is a secret. So when the token gets signed by the server, what you do is you have a secret, like a key, and it's going to take those three pieces of information and it will, it will sign it. So the only way that, you know, the server can verify it again, a user can't say, I logged in as Dave Humphrey, but now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sneakily go in here and change the value from Dave Humphrey to John Doe, and now all of a sudden I'm, I have different rights as a user. Well, that won't work because as soon as you modify anything in either of these two parts, then it, it's not gonna be possible for the signature to match up. So we're relying on hashing algorithms to help us here. So the actual text gets encoded using base64 URL encoding. So this, this content could be put on a URL or it could be embedded inside of an HTTP header or other things. So it's just gonna be text, but this is what it actually comes out to. So this thing isn't encrypted. It's just been like, it's easy to take a, a token and decode it. So anybody could, could uh, base64 decode this and they'd be able to see this information. So you don't wanna put anything in here that's like a secret, but what is in here is a claim so that the user, when they come back to you, can say, I am 
the person who you gave this token to originally. So the token becomes a thing that we can um, we can give out to a user. So what's going to happen is when the user comes back to, to the server and they want to prove that they are who they say they are, they're going to use an extra header. So whenever they make a request to the server, they're going to add a header, the authorization header. And the authorization header is going to say um, that they have a particular type of credentials. So for us, we're going to put the Base64 encoded uh, JSON web token here, and we're going to use what's called the bearer scheme. So we'll say authorization bearer, and then this token will go here. And this, the web server will be able to pull that token off, inspect it, check that the signature matches what we expect, check that the user information matches, and then either allow or not allow the user based on that information. Okay? That's a lot. So let's let's work up the code and hopefully this will um, make a little more sense to you. Okay, so what, what do we have to do? Well, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to change my authentication. And I'm going to use start using some of the other modules that I pulled in. So one of the modules that I want to use is the JWT... Uh, JSON web token. I want to pull in the JSON web token module that we worked with before. And essentially what I want to do is when the user logs in, so remember how our login flow works. When, when the user logs in, we're going to check that, that we have a username and password, and then we're going to um, call into our uh, user's our users module to check that this works. The users module is going to use bcrypt to make sure that the password that re we received when you hash it, you also get the exact same hash back again. So we're going to know whether or not this uh, user information is correct. And then if the user information, username and password is correct, then what we're going to do is we're going to send back a JSON response and we're going to say you logged in successfully. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this and I'm going to say that in addition to logging in and you know it worked, I also want to say I'm going to pass you a token. So I need a function which is going to create a token for this username like so. So login worked and here is a token that you can use with subsequent requests. So let's, let's write a function to do this. Function create token takes a username. And what does it do? So let's get more information about this user out of the database. So I'm going to get the full name for this user from our users.byUsername function. Because I want to put, remember that our JSON web token has a payload. So inside the payload, I want to put the username and I also want to put their display name. So that if the Angular app wanted to show the person's name, you know, somewhere in the UI, they would have that information in the token. So I'm going to put that, I'm going to put that inside here. Okay, so we grab the full name. And now what I want to do is I want to create the payload. So I'm going to say that the payload is equal to an object that has, I'm going to use the language of JSON uh, web tokens, which is the subject of this is going to be equal to, so this is like a user ID. So in my case, this will be a username. And then I'm going to say that their name is equal to the full name that was just, that I just got out of the, out of the database. I'm not, I could put more information, but that's really all I need. Those are going to be my claims, okay? So this is the claims data that, this is what's inside the token. So the next thing that I need in order for this to work is I need some kind of a secret. So you can see here, there's a place where you need the header, the payload, and a secret. 
So right here, this is um, used to sign the key. Secret is equal to. Now, what you could do here is you could put in, you know, you could put in some kind of a string. But the problem with this is if you're putting this in Git or you're sharing this source code, you now have a problem because you've got a you've got a secret, like you've got something that can't be, can't ever get out, nobody can ever see. If you push this up to GitHub, well, now you've got your key on GitHub. So that's not that's absolutely not going to work. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this out of here and I'm going to read it from my environment. So I'm going to say process.env.jwt secret like that. So now over here in my env, I'm going to say uh, jwt secret and I'm going to put it over here. So I'll say JWT secret equals, and I'm gonna put whatever this is. Now, this is not a very good secret. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, essentially I need to generate a, a better, I need to generate a better uh, like random string. And there's lots of things you can use, like one password has a nice password generator. So what you could do is you could say, give me like 43, give me a hundred, give me a hundred characters of garbage. Copy this and I'm going to put that right here. So that'll be my secret. And I'm putting it in the environment. I'm not going to put it in the, I'm not going to put it over here because I don't want it to leak. I don't want to have this ever be, uh, you know, be something that anyone can, can find. And when I have a production server, it means that on my production server, I can read in the .env file, which can be different than the ones that my developers have. So if you have a team of 12 developers, everybody has their own .env file. You can all have your own secrets or whatever and do testing on your local host. And then when you ship it to production, uh, the team, even the team might not know, probably hopefully doesn't know what these secrets are. The fewer people that know this, the better um, for security reasons for trying to work with this data. Okay, so we need a payload, we need a secret, and I want to add one more part to this, and that is options for generating my generating my JWT. Let me just show you. So I'm using the JW the JSON Web Token library, and so I'm going to have a payload, I'm going to have a secret, and then you can also have options. And in your options, you can do things like you can specify which algorithm to use for signing you can also specify when it expires. So that's what I'm really interested in. So when you create, um, when you create any kind of security token, you don't, you, like users want their authentication to never expire. But from a security standpoint, you need it to not last forever because it's a risk. I mean, the fewer times you have to authenticate, it, it makes it more difficult for you to keep it secure if somebody stays authenticated for a year. So what we're going to do here is we're going to add in um, an options object, which is going to is going to have expires in. And then you could pick a value. So I don't know, like what, 12 hours? Is that too short? You could say three days. So you can see that this is the format that they have it here, like seven days or three days or something like that. But what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna make this configurable. So I'm gonna say process.env.jwt expires in or this. So this is gonna be another variable that I need to put in my env. let's say two days, I don't know. So in production, I could do one thing. And when I'm testing this, you could say, for example, I want this to expire in, you know, like 120 milliseconds. So you might say 120 milliseconds. If you were testing on localhost and you wanted to see that this was working, you could have an expiration that's really short. And then when you're in production, you could say, this is gonna be good for seven days, something like that. 
Okay, so going back to our web token, we have a payload, we have a secret, we have these options here, and now what we can do is we can create this token. So the way you do this is I'm gonna return jwt.sign, I'm gonna take the payload and the secret and the options, and I'm gonna use that to create a JSON web token and send that back to the caller of this function. So that means down here, I should get a token now when I log in, okay? Let's try it out. So I'm gonna save this and I'm gonna kill the server and I'm gonna restart it. And let's try logging in again. I'm gonna log in and I'm gonna pipe this through JQ. Okay, so now you can see when I logged in this time, I get a login successful message, but I also get a token. So I'm gonna take this token here and I'm gonna paste it into the debugger right here. So I'm gonna put this right here, okay? And you can see that it's got a header, this part, it's got the purple, so subscribers equal to Dave, name equals Dave Humphrey, it expires at this time. So you can see it's gonna expire uh, Friday, August 7th at 2.35. And you can see that it's not being, the signature is not working because I don't have the, I don't have the secret in here. If you were to, now this, um, they don't put any of their, like what you're doing on this website like you have to be really careful before you do this. So let's say for example, that just for testing purposes to see if this worked, I wanted to see if, if I copy this into here, you can see that it's now verified because I have my secret in there. Okay, so now this, I don't trust this anymore because I've now pasted this in. So let's run this again. Uh, let's run another one and see, make it really easy to change keys. Let's take this one, copy this. And I'm going to paste a new one in, save that, and now I would have a different, a different key. But at least you can see that this is working. So we have a JSON web token which says Dave Humphrey or the user Dave successfully logged in and now has this has this key. Okay, so this is good. So now the caller of the login route has the ability to hold on to this key, hold on to this token, and then use it in subsequent requests to the server to be able to do, do more work. Okay, so let's, let's take this a little bit further. What do we need to do next? Um, the next thing that we need to do is we need to protect our code so that it's not possible to call certain routes unless you've been authenticated. So my goal is, so let's say for example, I want this uh, to be a public, public route. Anybody can call this. But I want this to be a protected route. So the only way you can call this route is if you have previously been authenticated by this server, have a token, and are sending the token back to me in order to be able to, uh, in order to be able to log in and do this. Okay, so how, how do we, what changes do we have to make for this to work? We have to now change our Express Web App. We have to add in, um, we have to add in some more pieces here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work with Passport, JS, and uh, JWT modules to work. So I'm gonna pull in Passport. And I'm also gonna pull in from the Passport JWT uh, module, I'm gonna pull in two things. I'm gonna pull in Extract JWT and Strategy. And I'll explain both of these. Uh, passport JWT.
Okay, so what I want to do is I want to add middleware to the server so that every time somebody makes a request, remember what we're going to try and do. We're going to try and make it possible for a caller, HTTP caller, to pass extra an extra header which includes the token that we need to process. So what I want Passport to do is every time a request comes in, I want it to go and look for this data and figure out whether or not the token exists, the token is still valid, the token contains users that we know about, etc. I want it to do all of the verification work for me with every single request that comes in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add extra middleware before. So before my routes here, I want to add in some um, some passport middleware here. OK, step one, we need to tell our app to use Passport and I want to initialize it. So when I say when I initialize Passport, it means that it is setting it up so that you can start using the various strategies that Passport makes available to you. And the one that I'm going to use, let's just pull it up here, Passport JWT. All the docs are here. And this stuff can look overwhelming when you look at it the first time. So let me just take you through uh, bit by bit what we have to do. So essentially the way that Passport works is Passport doesn't know anything about authentication. It's the strategies that do. So depending, it, like if you're doing authentication based on JSON web tokens, or you're doing um, authentication based on SAML, which is an XML based uh, authentication uh, system, there's all different systems that you could use. We're using JWT. So the JWT specific stuff lives inside the strategy that we pulled in from here, from Passport JWT. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I want to um, tell Passport that I want it to use a new strategy, the strategy that I just pulled in from the Passport JWT module up above. So strategy, I'm going to, I'm going to create a new strategy like so. Inside here, what I have to do is I have to set it up with a bunch of different options. So step one is define a bunch of options for this strategy. So the first option that you have to decide when you're using this is how are you going to extract the token from the request? And there's a whole bunch of different possibilities. You can pull it out of the header, out of the body, you can pull it out of the URL, on and on and on all the way down. The one that I want to do is I want to use um, I want to use from the header as a bearer token. So it's going to look inside the authorization header for for a bearer token and it's going to pull that out. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say JWT uh, from request is equal to and there's already code written to do this and that's why I pulled in extract JWT. So I'm going to say extract jwt dot from auth header as bearer token like that. So the code to do this is already available. We just need to tell it this is the way that I want to extract my token whenever a request comes in. The next thing I need to do is I need to give it the secret. So I have to give it the secret or key it's called. So if you look back up here, you'll see that you have to put in secret or key. Secret or key for us is going to come from our environment. Process.env.jwt secret. So the secret is used in multiple places in my app. I'm not going to hard code it. I'm going to put it in the environment so that over here I can just grab it from my environment when this thing runs. So those are the options that I have to give it. Now the second thing that you have to give it is you have to, you have to write a function which is going to verify the JWT. Um, 
So after Passport extracts the token from the header, it's going to it's going to use your secret to make sure that the data that's in the payload matches how it was signed. So if it's been tampered with at all, it's going to reject it. So you know that it's legitimate because it's, you know, the signing information is built into the JWT. So then what it's going to do is it's going to hand me the payload. So I have the payload available to me and it's up to me to verify whether I think that the payload is right. So I'm going to get a payload that looks like this. It's going to be an object. It's going to have sub and name and expiry and all that. And I need to figure out whether or not um, this is legitimate. So the first thing I'm going to do, and by the way, when I'm when I am done verifying it, I call the done function. So the done function is the next part of the middleware callback. It's going to it's basically saying I'm done verifying. Go to the next step. So step one is if if for some reason we don't have a payload, then I'm going to return done and I'm going to say um, there wasn't an error, but the user is not logged in. I don't know who this user is. I don't have any information. So when you want to say that there wasn't an error, but but the user is not logged in, then you just pass false. If if however you had user information, you would pass the user information on and say this. I know this user. Everything's fine. But in this case, everything is not fine because I don't have the information that I expect. So the next possibility is if I have a payload, then what I'd like to do is I'd like to make sure that I have a user in my database for this username. So I'm going to reach into the payload and I'm going to get the subject of the payload here. And I'm going to see if I have a user who matches that description. Now remember, the only way that they got this was if they, uh, like the token came from me originally and I'm the one who put that information in there. So this is a way for me to say like, you know, do you know who this user is? Like, is this, like if I needed to figure out, is this user, what role this user has in my system? This user is an administrator or a regular user, or this is my chance to do it. So. In this case, I'm doing something really simple. I'm just making sure that I have a user. Now, if I don't have a user, then I'm gonna say done null false. Again, because like, you know, this user, maybe the user's been deleted from the database. So maybe there used to be a user, but I've canceled their account and they still have a token and the token hasn't expired, but I'm not going to let them log in because this account has this account's been removed from the database. The final thing is if I actually do have um, have the information that I want, then I'm going to say done, null, and I'll I'll just attach the user here, or I could just attach a portion of the user information if I wanted to. So I could say something like uh, username is user dot username and full name is user dot full name, something like that. Okay, so we set up passport middleware. We define a new strategy based on the JWT strategy module that we pull in. We configure it with our secret plus an algorithm for extracting the token from the HTTP headers in a request. And then we write a, a custom verification function to figure out whether or not we want to allow this user to, to uh, be verified in the system. Okay, so now that we've done that, what that's going to allow us to do is go and add protection to our uh, bridges routes. And I'll show you how we do that. So I'm going to go to bridges and I'm going to leave this one public, but I want to protect this one. So I'm going to, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to pull in passport like so. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put another 
middleware function right here. So whenever you define a route, you're saying um, call this function, call this function, um, and it's the last function in the chain. But what you can do is you can insert as many functions as you want. You can insert all this middleware that happens beforehand. So to make this a bit easier to read, let me break this into multiple lines. So I'm going to specify, I'm going to specify another function that I want to run. here. Um, but I don't have to write the function here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use passport has a function called authenticate. And what you do with authenticate is you tell it which strategy you want to authenticate with. So I'm going to authenticate with the JWT strategy because that's the, so if we go back here, let me show you what I mean. Yeah, here's an example. So you can see here, passport.authenticate JWT, like so. And you can see that it also says session is false. I'm going to do the same. So I'm going to say session is false. So session is false because I'm not using sessions. I'm going to have, like, you're always going to have to send this token. I'm not going to store... Passport can store user information on the request so that as you're processing things, you can say request.user and you can work with that. And sometimes that's what you want to do. But in this case, I don't want to do that. My web token is going to allow me to have this stateless kind of uh, system where you log in, I give you a token, and then you go away and then sometime later you come back again and you request the bridges ID route. And when you do, you pass me a token and that's how I allow you to come in and do what you're going to do. So what we've done here is before we run our, our, our actual route function, we put a little piece of authentication middleware in here. And in order to get to this function, you have to get through this function. So unless the token that you have is legitimate and all of it verifies, then we're not going to let you through to this and it's just going to fail. Okay, so we should be able to test this. This should work. So let's, let's restart our server. And let's do the following. So I'm going to... I'm going to log in again as me so that I have a token. So based on, let me just copy this token so I have it. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try hitting these routes. So the first route that I'm going to try and hit is the API bridges route. So if I say curl, um, localhost 3000 API bridges and I'll just pipe this through JQ. You can see that I get back a whole bunch of bridges and it didn't I didn't have to include any extra authentication information. I just I just was able to hit this. Same thing if I was in my browser if I went to localhost 3000 API bridges, it would give me back all that data and I'm not including any extra information with, uh, with the request. You can see if I were to go to my network tab, if I refresh this, and if I click on this, you can see that the request headers are down here at the bottom. And there's a whole bunch of headers that got sent, but none of these is the authorization header. So there's no information in here about about you know working with the authorization header, so that that isn't going to work. So now let's do a test. Let's try calling this route here. So if I call this one and I have to pass in an ID, so let's say that I do bridges slash, and I'll just use this bridge right here. So if I say bridge dash forty seven dash four one five dash c, okay, and this should fail. So I'm going to run this and. Can you see down here in my server, it received it, but I now get a 401. And up here, you can see that I got an unauthorized. 
And if you look, you can see that what's happening is this has blocked me from getting in there. It's, it's no longer possible for me to do it. So if I did the same thing over here, if I asked for bridge, um, bridges slash, let's just pick one, bridge 45-159C, uh, 159-C. You can see that I get back a 401. I'm unauthorized, so I, I can't get in there. So the route exists, it's there, but it's not possible to hit it because it's been protected by passport authentication using JWT. So it's looking for, it's looking for a token to be extracted from the authorization header and to, to pass this set of verification steps and it's not seeing it. So let's give it one. So here's what I would do. I'm gonna modify my request. So I'm gonna do my same request, but I'm gonna add an extra header. So the way you add headers with curl is you would say, I wanna add another header. And my header is, I wanna add the authorization header and I wanna pass in bearer. And then I wanna pass in my token. Shoot, I lost my, let me, let me log in again so I can get this token. Okay, I need this token and I need, this will work. Oh wait, this one. Okay, so I want to curl, add the authorization bearer, paste in my token. Then I want to go to localhost 3000 API bridges bridge this. And oh, it almost worked. <laughs> so you can see that I got an error. Down here you can see users is not defined on line 38 of app.js. So what did I do wrong here? App.js is using users, but I didn't import it. Uh, let's just do that. Let me pull this in. Let's try that again. So I'm going to kill my server, restart the server. I'm going to log in. I'm going to grab my token. I'm going to authorization bearer token localhost um, 3000 API bridges slash, and we'll do bridge 47-415-C, and that worked. So you can see down here, I've got a 200. If I pipe this through JQ, you can see what it gave me back. So it gives me back my object. Now, if I did that again, if I, don't have a correct token. Let's say I take one of these characters away from my token. Um, let me get rid of JQ. I get unauthorized. It won't let me through. So if for some reason I don't have the authorization header, if it's not included, I'm going to be I'm going to be uh, locked out. What am I doing wrong? Yeah, unauthorized, 401, 401, 401. So this is perfect. So now we have a, we have a secured route using JSON web tokens. And we've got securely hashed and salted passwords for our users. We are, we're ready to connect this up into our Angular app. So that's, that's what I wanna do now because obviously I don't wanna use my API, uh, all of it you know, through the command line and curl and so on. I wanna be able to connect this data into other parts of my system. But this is great, being able to, being able to use a JSON web token as a way to authenticate a user with a system 
but then the user can basically disconnect from that system and the server, the web server doesn't have to have any knowledge of sessions or information about that user afterwards. They just give them the token and then that token can be used, you know, to come back again or to go to another system when you're doing like single sign-on solutions where you sign on with one system and then that token is like a ticket to get you into a whole bunch of other boxes inside of um, an application's network. Okay, so I'm gonna pause this here. And in the next video, what we're gonna do is we're going to go up a level and we're gonna use all of this authentication logic inside of our uh, Angular app.